Welcome to the lesson for notation and higher order derivatives. Uh, oftentimes it's helpful when working with derivatives, especially those of composed functions, to use a special notation called Leibniz notation. Now Leibniz we talked about before is the gentleman that was considered to be a one of the founders of calculus along with Isaac Newton and it is pronounced Leibniz. The other founder, again, Isaac Newton. Interesting, there's a book called The Calculus Wars for those of us math nerds that want to dig deeper into this, but these two gentlemen worked independently. They were contemporaries of each other. They knew about each other, but they worked independently, and within a short span of years, both of them had claimed to discover calculus on their own, and both claimed that it was their discovery and there was a big fight about it and there's a book that covers it called the calculus wars so leibniz notation is used most often when working with derivatives and again we'll see later on with integrals because his notation allows us to follow the flow of events in the derivative process really really clearly much more so than prime notation does so leibniz notation is something that is all over the ap test something we need to become very familiar with. So here's what Leibniz notation looks like. It looks like dy over dx. It looks like a fraction where the numerator is dy and the denominator is dx. This is stated as the derivative with respect to x of y. So we're going to take d dx, the derivative with respect to x, of this function y. We generally don't write it in this form, however, we write it in this form. And you can say things like dy dx, the derivative of y with respect to x, however you want to state it's just fine with me. Understanding that the notation means derivative is what I'm after here. Lots of times we'll just say dy dx or the derivative. But understand that this notation does say the derivative of y with respect to x. Right now, this is not a quotient. This is not a fraction. This is just operator notation, an operator symbol, just like y prime or just like f prime of x. Okay, these all mean the same thing. Now later on, and the beauty and power of Leibniz notation is, is later on, we are going to consider it like a quotient, and, and we'll see that, especially in integral calculus. But for right now, when you see dy dx, I want you to think derivative. And every time you think derivative, I want you to think slope of the tangent line. Okay, that's what we're after here. That's what the derivative is for us. So this notation is very specific with respect to its actions. It tells us many things about our function. It tells us that's our independent variable. It tells us that's our dependent variable. It tells us we are going to have a function y that is given to us as some manipulation, mathematical manipulation, on the independent variable x. So we, we determine a lot just from this Leibniz notation. We know which is the independent variable, which is the dependent variable. The power of this is that depending on what context we're in, we can use different variables and connect them directly and uniquely to a meaningful symbol for the exact function that we're dealing with. Here we would say the derivative of y with respect to t. Also we would write it dy dt. The derivative of f with respect to s, df ds. The derivative of h with respect to r, dh dr most commonly what's on this farthest right column is how you're going to see it written. But I do want you to understand that this is acceptable notation as well. They both mean the same thing. They both mean the slope of the tangent line. The variable that's in the derivative, or sorry, in the denominator is always your independent variable as far as that function is concerned. And the variable in the numerator is your dependent variable. Is that to say that we could not have a function h given to us in r, and they couldn't ask for dr dh? Yes, they could. They could ask for the derivative of the independent variable with respect to the dependent variable. But by and large, we're not talking about the derivative at that point. We're not talking, well, we are talking about a derivative, but we're not talking about slope of the tangent line at that point. 
All right, so Leibniz notation for the chain rule. I want to revisit the chain rule here for a little bit because I gave it to you in function notation. It was the derivative of the outside not changing the inside times the derivative of what's inside. And I want you to see in Leibniz notation, here if we have a function that is composed, we have y of u of x. That's what we've got going on here. And so the chain rule technically is, again, the derivative of the outside function here with respect to the inside function. That's where we get the not changing what's inside times, this is where the times comes from here, the derivative of the inside function with respect to the independent variable. So Leibniz notation allows us to see that in the end we are going to wind up with the derivative of the outside function with respect to the innermost variable, the independent variable. The definition of the chain rule is unchanged. I still want us to verbalize it the way we verbalize it. Again, that's going to work for us no matter what type of function that we're working with. Later during integration, the notation becomes invaluable for integration by parts, for keeping up with all the little parts of an integral. Your text will use this notation from now on almost exclusively. It's something I want you very comfortable with because it is all over the AP test. And here would be the compound chain rule. So Leibniz allows us to follow, this is the beauty and the power of his notation, he allows us to follow what's going on with even a compound chain rule. We have some function y given to us in terms of u and u given to us in terms of v and v given to us in terms of x. So that says we have y of u of v of x. And it may be very hard to follow in function notation, but it's very easy to follow how we're going to wind up with the derivative of the outside function with respect to the independent variable when you walk all the way through Leibniz notation. So his notation was extremely powerful. All right, just as we can take the first derivative, and we understand that a function, if it has a derivative, we can find it, and when we find that derivative, the result is another function. So the original function f of x is a function. The derivative function f prime of x is a function. And so if we were to take the derivative of the derivative, it should yield us another function. So we can take the derivative of the new function, and again, and again, and again, depending on the makeup of the original function, and we should always result in another function. So the higher order derivative, second derivative, third derivative, and so on, have nice qualities in the real world, and we're going to use them. They have really nice qualities in the plane, in the xy plane. So the Leibniz notation we explored is also used for higher order derivatives. I will give that to you at the end of this lesson. We'll see what Leibniz notation looks like for higher and higher order derivatives. So we learned the first derivative was a tool for finding instantaneous velocity at any given point along a horizontal axis. From this point forward, we'll discuss instantaneous velocity using only the single word velocity. So when you read velocity, you need to think instantaneous velocity. And for us, velocity is derivative, right? Instantaneous velocity is the derivative. That is slope of the tangent line on the position function. So not just some generic function, this function has a real world application and that's the position of some object. Now you'll hear me say this over and over and over again as we go through these lessons this school year. The people that write the AP test absolutely love object or particle motion. They love to, to move a particle around in the plane. They love to move objects around in the plane. A lot of the questions may not, you know, be physically talking about a ball or, 
an atom or a molecule or a child. Lots of times they'll just say an object's doing this, answer this question. A particle acts like this, answer this question. And if you'll, you know, kind of take a step back and, and get a big picture view of what those questions are going to ask you, they're pretty much all the same. If you can just determine that you're in an object motion problem or particle motion problem, then all of those are pretty much answered the same way. So here's an example. I don't know if we'll get all the way through it by the end of this video. There'll definitely be another video to this lesson, and I'll continue on that. An object moves along a coordinate line so that its position, s, satisfies this function, s of t equals 2t squared minus 12t plus 8, where s is measured in centimeters and t in seconds with t greater than or equal to 0. Determine the velocity of the object when t equals 1 and when t equals 6. When is the velocity 0? When is it positive? Now, I said this before when we worked some examples before. The words are just as important, if not more important, than all the little math symbols in here. Now, the math symbols in here, I mean, they mean something, but the words are really what's most important when you're answering a problem like this. So we have object motion, an object moves along a coordinate line so that it's position s. So we know that s of t is a position function. So we're talking about position. If we start talking about the velocity of position, we're talking derivative and they give us the s of t function. They tell us the units. It's measured in centimeters. t is measured in seconds. This is important. t can be zero or positive values only. There are no negative t values that make sense for this object moving. And it says determine the velocity of the object when t equals one and t equals six. Well, if you give me s of t and you ask me to find the velocity then we're talking s prime of t which could also be written in Leibniz notation as ds dt and that is the velocity well this is a polynomial function so I'm going to use my derivative rules and the velocity is the derivative of the first term, copy down the minus, derivative of the second term, and the derivative of the third term is zero. So here's my velocity function. Here's v of t for any time t. It says find the velocity when t is one and when t is six. So v of one equals four times one minus 12, that's negative eight, v of six, is 4 times 6 minus 12. That's 24 minus 12, so that's a positive 12. Now, if they give me units, I need to attach units to the derivative function. All right, I'm really not done. This is negative 8 centimeters per second. And this is positive 12 centimeters per second. I guess we usually write cm, don't we? <coughs> centimeters per second. So there's the first part of it. We've answered everything up to there. So when is the velocity zero? When? When, 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 when? When you read the word when, it's saying for what time value? So we need a time value, and we need that time value specifically when velocity equals zero. Well, here's the velocity function, so I'm going to find that time value by setting the velocity function equal to zero. So 4t equals 12, t equals 3. What is the units? That's 3 seconds. So the velocity is 0 at 3 seconds.